This lecture is part of Berkeley Math 115, an introductory undergraduate course on number theory, and will be mostly about solving equations modulo prime powers. So the problem we have is we want to solve the equation f of x is congruent to 0 modulo m. And we quickly recall we do this in several steps. First of all, we can reduce to the case where m is a prime power using the Chinese remainder theorem. Um, next, we reduce um, from the case of prime powers to the case of primes. And thirdly, we, we, we do the case of um, m being a prime. And what we're going to do in today's lecture is um, this one here. So I previously covered the Chinese remainder theorem, and in a future lecture we'll be discussing the, the case when m is, is, is a prime um, number. So we're going to discuss several methods for reducing from the case p to the n to the case of p. These can be called, um, first, the first method we're going to discuss is the stupid method. Um, the next case is the not quite so stupid method. Um, the third case is um, essentially Hensel's lemma or Hensel's method. And the fourth method is Newton's method. Um, actually, um, this is really only three methods because Hensel's method and Newton's method are really the same, except they're, they're, they're well, they're, 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 they're the same if you look deeply. I mean, superficially they look different, but they're, they're really the same method. So um, let's try and solve the following equation in order to illustrate the methods. Let's solve, um, let's suppose we want to solve x squared is congruent to 7 modulo 3 to the 100. Um, and let's try a stupid method is to try um, x equals 0, 1, 2, all the way up to 3 to the 100. Well, 3 to the 100 minus 1, I guess. Well, this is obviously far too slow. Um, so here we have 3 to the 100 is our number p to the n. And this is going to take about on the order of p to the n steps. And this will just be huge, at least if n is reasonably large. You know, you, know, you take more than the age of the universe to find this solution. Um, so let's have a slightly better method. Um, what we're going to do is first of all solve mod 3 to the 1, then mod 3 to the 2, then mod 3 to the 3, and so on, and gradually work our way up. So um, we can solve mod 3. We want to solve x squared as common to 7 mod 3. And here, well, the prime is pretty small, so let's just use trial and error. Um, we just test all the numbers mod 3 to see which of them has um, um, square equal to 7. And, and we can find the solution is x is congruent to 1 mod 3. We, there, there's another solution, x is congruent to minus 1 mod 3, but let's just take x equals 1 mod 3. And next we want to solve the equation. Actually, let, 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 let's call this x1. Next, we want to solve x squared as congruent to 7 mod 3 squared. And we, we notice that this implies that x is 7 mod 3. So, so let's start by taking x is congruent to x1 mod 3. Um, and now, um, this means that x is equal to x1 or x1 plus 3 or x1 plus 6. And we can just try these and see which works. So try um, to see which works. And if we do this, um, we can um, find um, um, x. We, we find a solution x2 um, is equal to x1 plus 3 times 1. So, so, so we take this, this solution here. And now we do the same thing. We want to solve x squared as congruent to 7 mod 3 cubed. And we try um, x is going to be equal to x2 plus 3 squared times something or other. And 
there are only three possibilities because I carefully chose three to be a small prime here. If this was a bigger prime, this would be a bit more difficult. We'll discuss that in a moment. And we find that um, we, we can then find that x, let's call it x3, is going to be um, x1, which is 1, plus 3 times 1. So this is this is x2. And then we, we just do some trial and error. And um, we, we, we find um, we get naught times, um, sorry, what 1 times um, 3 squared. And then we can go on like this and we find x4 is equal to 1 plus 1 times 3 plus 1 times 3 squared plus 0 times 3 cubed and so on. And we can keep on producing more and more numbers like this as long as our patience holds out. Um, in fact, you can think of this as, as um, the, the, the number for x form 1, 1 plus 1 times 3 plus 1 times 3 squared plus 0 times 3 cubed sort of looks like a number in base 3. So we can just write it out as 1, 1, 1, um, 0 in base 3. And we can continue like this, in fact, and we find it sort of looks like um, this in base 3. In, in other words, if, if we take this bit of the number, it will be a solution modulo 3 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and so on. Um, so that's the slightly better method, and let's check how many steps to work um, to get a solution mod p to the n. Well, we need n steps um, where we take x1 up to x2 up to xn, but each step we need to search through p possible answers. So it takes about O of p, n, p times n steps, which is much less than O of p to the n steps, which was the stupid method. So we speeded things up a reasonable amount. And if p is small, like 3 or 5 or something, this is actually a perfectly good method. Um, but it's not going to work so well if p is really large. You know, so if, if p is a 10 or 20 digit number, then this will, this will get rather tediously slow. Fortunately, there's a better method um, but uh, due to Hensel. But before doing that, um, let's discuss a problem with this method. Um, so you notice um, we're taking x1 and then lifting it to a solution x2 and then lifting it to a solution x3. So this is modulo 3, this is modulo 3 squared, modulo 3 cubed and so on. And we have the following problem. Can we always lift xi to xi plus 1. Is this unique? Now, in the problem we did of working out x squared is congruent to 7 modulo 3 to the n, um, it turns out the lift always is, exists and always is unique. However, this, this does not always, this need not be true. The solution sometimes might not exist and might not be unique even if it does exist. So, so let's see an example where it gets a bit more complicated. Let's do the example of x squared is congruent to 17 modulo 2 to the something big, say 2 to the 10. Um, and let's solve it mod 2. Well, mod 2, x is going to be congruent to 1. There's no problem. Mod 4, there are two things, x can be 1 or 3, so 1 squared and 3 squared are both 17 mod 2. Mod 8, there's no problem yet. We get 1, 5, 3 and 7. And the reason I'm writing them in this funny order is because 1 and 5 lift 1 and 3 and 7 kind of lift, lift 3. Um, so um, here... We're getting two ways of lifting a solution mod 4 to a solution mod 8 and two ways of lifting um, this solution to a mod 8. So, so the solution is not unique. Um, but it gets worse because if we do 1 and 16, um, we, we, we can lift 1 to 1 or 9 modulo 16 and we can lift 7 um, um, to um, 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 15 or um, 7, I think. And um, uh, however, we can't lift 3 or 5 at all. So 3 and 5 turn out to be sort of fake solutions that you, you, you can't lift them any further. 
so, so we, we we come to a stop at this point um and mod 32 um similarly nine can be lifted to nine and it can also be lifted to 41 um um so nine lifts to nine or 25 um seven can be lifted to seven or to 23 um, and 15 has no lifts to a solution and one has no lifts and um, um, it sort of goes on like this at each step some of the solutions can be lifted to two solutions and some of the solutions have no lifts at all so this is rather more complicated than the case of x squared is congruent to 3 modulo 3 to the, to the n um, um, so um, now we get on to Hensel's lemma, which will sort of partly explain why why this kind of goes wrong and the previous example worked. So so Hensel's lemma um, looks the following. Suppose we've solved f of x1 is congruent to 0 mod p. And we try to solve f of x1 plus a p is congruent to 0 mod p squared. So we've got a solution is a solution mod p. And this is going to be a solution mod p squared, which lifts the solution we found mod p by adding a multiple of p. And a is the number that we're trying to find. So, so we want to find what is a. Well, let's apply Taylor's theorem, where we can, you, you remember this says um, f of, um, this says f of x1 plus a times p is equal to f of x1 plus um, a p times the derivative of f of x1 um, plus a p squared over 2 factorial times the second derivative of x1 and so on and if x1 is a polynomial then um well you, you might think we can't really differentiate things because you know f is a sort of function mod p or something but we can define derivatives of polynomials perfectly well and this formula works just fine for polynomials it's not really an infinite series at all it's, it's just a finite series that you can check and now this is going to be mostly divisible by p squared. Well, maybe not, because we've got this division by two factorial. So if p was equal to 2, we, we might possibly get a little problem there. We'll have to discuss that later. So let's put a slight question mark there, because we kind of hope this is going to be divisible by p squared. And we hope all the other terms will also be divisible by p squared. And now we've got to solve this. We want this to be this bit to be congruent to 0 mod p squared. And you notice that f of x1 is already 0 mod p by assumption. So we've got to add a multiple of p. And to do this, all we have to do is to solve a p f prime of x is congruent to p times something or other modulo p squared and then we can divide through by p and we have to solve a of f prime of x sorry x1 um, is congruent to something or other modulo p since we're dividing this by p we need to divide the this thing by p as well so we've got to solve this equation for a where where star is some complicated mess i don't really care about i mean you can work out what it is and you notice this is solvable if f prime of x1 is not congruent to 0 modulo p, because then it has an inverse. Um, so uh, this sort of explains why the first problem we did of solving x squared minus 7 is congruent to 0 mod 3 to the n has a solution, because the derivative of this is 2x and 2x um, at x equals 1 is non-zero mod 3, whereas if we try and solve the other one, um, x squared is congruent to 17 
modulo 2 to the n, then we notice that the derivative is actually divisible by p at the solution we found, which is, which is why things were going a bit funny. Um, so, um, so, for example, this says we can solve um, x squared is congruent to 7 modulo 3 to the n for any n because um, the derivative, if we, if we take f of x is x squared minus 7, then f prime of x is equal to 2x, and this is not congruent to 0, mod 3 for x equals x1, where x1 is, is, is the number 1. Um, um, so, uh, okay, well, strictly speaking, we, we only showed that work for the first step, but if, if we do, if, if we try and solve modulo p to the n plus 1, so we can say if, we, if, we, if we've got a solution f of x n is congruent to 0 mod p to the n, we want to lift this to f of x n plus a times p is congruent to 0 modulo p to the n plus 1, and you can do almost exactly the same thing um, that we did in the case n equals 1. We just write this as f of x n plus a p f prime of x n, and we notice that this is not congruent to 0 mod p, and then this is going to be a p, a p all squared times something or other, and this will be divisible um, by um, um, uh, it will be divisible by um, um, p to the n plus 1, if we go far enough. You, you notice that... Um, um, so, sorry, uh, that, that, that's not an a times p, it's a, a times p to the n here. So that's a times p to the n squared, and this is indeed divisible by p to the n plus 1. Um, so um, just as before, this um, ends up having to solve um, a times f prime of xn is congruent to something complicated modulo p. And we can solve this because f prime of x is not congruent to 0 mod p. Um, well, there was one slight problem that we um, put off for later. You remember there was this funny factorial on the bottom. Um, so it's not entirely clear that this really is divisible by, by um, some power of p because, you, you know, there, there might be some factors of p in the bottom. So let's take a closer look at this. So we, we, we've got a term... Um, something to the n times d by df to the n of f of something divided by n factorial. And the key point here is that if we take a polynomial f of x and d differentiate it n times and divide by n factorial, this has integer coefficients. Um, so we can take a look at this. So, so um, f of x might be, say, let, let, let's just do the case of x to the k. Um, it, it's enough to do a monomial by linearity. Then the first derivative is k x to the k minus 1. Well, this simply has integral coefficients. The next derivative is k times k minus 1 x to the k minus 2. And if we divide that by 2 factorial, then this still has integer coefficients um, because either k or k minus 1 is even, so this division by 2 really doesn't matter. The next derivative is going to be k, k minus 1, k minus 2, and then we have to divide by a 3 factorial from the Taylor series, and then we get x to the k minus 3. And we notice this is again an integer because it's just a binomial coefficient. And binomial coefficients are integers. So um, the, 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 the coefficients of the derivatives of x to the k, uh, if we take the nth derivative and divide by n factorial, this will always be an integer because it's just a binomial coefficient. So um, when, we, when we wanted all these things to be divisible by p squared or whatever, the, all the factorials at the bottom don't really matter because they're cancelled out by by um, factors we get by taking a high derivative of f. Um, so to summarise, 
we get Hensel's lemma. We can solve um, f of x is congruent to 0 mod p to the n if, first of all, we can solve mod p. So we find f of x1 is congruent to 0 mod p. So we have to solve mod p just to get everything going. And secondly, we want f prime of x1 is not congruent to 0 mod p. And if this condition holds, then x1 can be lifted to a unique solution modulo p to the n for any n. Um, so we, we notice that this condition really is necessary. So for instance, x squared is congruent to 5 um, can be solved mod 2 and 2 squared, but not modulo 2 cubed. And you see this condition fails. We have f of x equals x squared minus 5 and x1 equals 1, but f prime of x1 is not congruent to 0 modulo modulo 2. So condition 2 fails. I mean, we can we can find a solution mod 2 and we can even lift it to a solution mod 2 squared, but then we get stuck mod 2 cubed. Um, so um, um, now, now um, Hensel's method is a lot faster if p is large because the number of steps is very roughly O of n. Well, there, there should be factors of log of p to the power of something in there, but um, um, you, 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 you can say that this is less than the previous method, which was um, took about p times n steps because every step we had to test p different values. And Hensel's lemma says, provide the derivative is non-zero, you don't have to test all these p values. You can just find the, 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 the solution directly by, by dividing by the derivative, which is fast using Euclid's algorithm. Um, so, um, um, Finally, we will discuss Newton's method. Now, if you've been to a numerical analysis course, or maybe even a calculus course, we've come across Newton's method for real functions. So we want to solve f of x equals zero, where f is now some sort of real function. And you remember it goes like this. What we do is we uh, sort of look at the graph of um, um, uh, f of x, so this is y equals f of x. And then we choose some value um, x1, say. And what you do is you is you make the following construction. You you draw the um you, you look at the point on the graph with x coordinate x1, and then you draw the tangent line down here. And this is going to be the point x2. And then you do the same thing again. You draw the tangent line here and we get the point x3. And geometrically, it's very plausible that these numbers x1, x2 and x3 will, will get closer and closer to a root of f of x. So um, um, uh, we can easily write down the formula for xn plus 1. You can see that this point here is x1 um, f of x1. And this line here has slope, the, the, the tangent of f at x1. So you can work out what the tangent line is and work out where it intersects the origin. And we find x2 um, is equal to x1 minus f of x1 divided by f prime of x1. And similarly, x of n plus 1 is equal to x of n minus f of xn divided by f prime of xn. So... This is Newton's method. And sometimes it converges to a root of f, and sometimes it goes horribly wrong. Um, I mean, if, um, if you start close to a zero of multiplicity one, then Newton's method works really, really well and converges really fast. If you start at some random point, then Newton's method sometimes just goes completely chaotic and can start x1, x2, and x3 can sort of start jumping all over the place or end up in a cycle or something weird. So anyway, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, so now instead of doing it for the reals, um, let's do it for 
um, modulo p to the n. So suppose f of x, suppose f of x is congruent to zero modulo p to the n for some n. And we're going to now look at x minus f of x divided by f prime of x. So, so we apply Newton's method. Let's try and uh, work out what this is. Well, we have f of x minus f of x over f prime of x. And we expand this out by Taylor's theorem. So it's going to be f of x um, plus um, 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 f prime of x times minus f of x over f prime of x. So that's this term here. Um, then we get um, plus um, um, f double prime of x over 2 factorial times minus f of x over f prime of x all squared um, and so on. And now um, the key point here is that the first two terms cancel. In fact, Newton's method is uh, the, the, the choice of this um, funny correction to x is sort of more or less designed so that the first two terms cancel out with each other. And what about the remaining terms? Well, well, this will be some sort of integer because you remember the two factorial kind of cancels out with the, with the second derivative. And what about this term here? Well, this will be divisible by p to the 2n if f prime of x is not congruent to 0 modulo p, because if it's not congruent to 0 mod p, then it has an inverse modulo p to the n, and this and f of x is divisible by p to the n, so f of x squared is also divisible by p to the n. And similarly, all the remaining terms will be divisible by p cubed, p to the 4, and so on. So the conclusion is that f of x minus f of x over f prime of x is congruent to 0 mod p to the 2n if f prime of x is not congruent to 0 mod p. If it is congruent to 0 mod p, we, we may not even be able to do this division modulo p. Um, so, so this gives um, um, Newton's method. It says that um, if f of x is congruent to 0 mod p to the n and f prime of x is not congruent to 0 mod p, then f of x minus f of x over f prime of x is congruent to 0 modulo p to the 2n. And you notice this condition will still be satisfied for the new solution because this is congruent to x modulo p. So, so, um, so if we start off with a number whose derivative is non-zero, we will keep getting numbers whose derivative is non-zero. So we double the um, the, the, the um, exponent of p at each step. And you notice this is actually much better than Hensel's method because Hensel's lemma, Hensel's method sort of adds one to the exponent each step, whereas now we're actually doubling it. Um, but actually, they're not really all that different. You notice both Newton's method and Hensel's method depend on the fact that derivative is non-zero. And this should give you a strong hint that they're actually very closely related. And in fact, you find that Newton's method really is just Hensel's method if you write it out, except we're, we're noticing. You just sort of do Hensel's method, except you just notice that you actually double the number of... Um, double the exponent of p. So let's just have an example of Newton's method. Um, so um, um, let's solve, um, suppose we found the solution 13 squared is congruent to 7 modulo 3 cubed. So um, and we want to solve something squared is congruent to 7 mod 3 to the 6. So we take our polynomial to be f of x is equal to x squared minus 7. So f prime of x it's just 2x. 
Um, so f prime of 13 is equal to 26, which is not congruent to 0 mod 3, so we're OK. Um, so the new root is um, 13 minus 13 squared minus 7 divided by 26. So this is this is this is the number x. This is f of x, and this 26 is f prime of x. And of course, we're we're doing all this modulo um, three to the six. We're not we're not we're not taking the this the rational number 13 squared minus 17 over 26. We're taking 13 squared minus 7 over 26 modulo three to the six. And you can work this out using Euclid's algorithm as before, and this is congruent to 175 modulo 3 to the 6. So 175 squared is congruent to 7 mod 3 to the 6. And if we repeat this, we will get a solution modulo 3 to the power of 12 and then 3 to the power of 24. So the number of um, the, the exponent of n is increasing really rapidly. Um, OK, so uh, I think I'll have a break now. In the next part of this lecture, I'll discuss what happens if the derivative of f is um, non-zero.